So the next question goes back to talking about the three-year contracts mm -hmm. that have been put in place. Um, so is it possible to, do you think it's possible to consistently deliver quality language teaching when the teachers are on three-year contracts? Um, it is possible when you extend the contracts and you hand out more three-year contracts after the first three-year contract. But um, imagine the people sitting in these positions. I mean, what they will do, and I think it's most naturally, is they will try to get away. Yeah, that's and um, uh, on an, uh, in another direction, I would say I've been here now for almost three years for a new lecturer coming in here from Europe, it takes quite some time to adapt because it is, it is a special environment. Um, we've got 70% of Asian students and you have to somehow get them together with the other um, the Australian students and um, uh, you have different assessment procedures, etc. etc. So it takes some time to settle in and it takes some time to um, acquire the experience you need to walk into a course even though you have taught it for several times and say yes now I've established routines that work yeah, and um, by means of feedback of the students I can improve these routines or can change things but uh, now this course is established. Yeah. My example would be Literary Chinese 1 and 2 uh, that I've been teaching uh, I've been teaching this, have been teaching them for six years before in German universities, um, but have adapted them to to um, uh, a new requirements, and now they run smoothly. And students, I hope to can say that, I hope to be able to say that are um, uh, quite satisfied with the way with the courses uh, are run. They learn a lot. They take away a lot from the courses, and I, as a teacher, take a lot, uh, take away a lot too, um, uh, because it's always a new experience with these, with uh, with different students. So, this was a three-year contract experience. But if you ask myself now, after three years, I would be in the position of saying yes. If you want to keep me, keep me continuing to teach literary Chinese classes. Now I'm in a good position to do so and to offer this on a, on a broad range. Yeah. But that's the point when I will be leaving on a three-year contract. Yeah. And so, uh, to sum up, no, it doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't work. Yeah. Another way of, of ruining the system. Because mm. if, as you say, it takes three years to build up, mm -hmm. sort of, to get used to the system and to work out how the course was run and to adapt it to the students, then it takes three years to do that, and by the time you've done that, you've gone, and we start the process again and again. And yeah, yeah. It's just not going to work. You yeah, and even though mm. if you hand over your entire materials to mm. to the person coming next, um, he will have to go through the process how he can adapt these materials to his mm. teaching, whether he likes to use them or not, whether he's using a different teaching material because he has some reasons or some preferences for that. Uh, and it's also problematic for students. So mm. every time you come up to these, to these um, uh, intersections between one three-year contract and the next three-year contract with another person, um, uh, it will also be problematic for students. Yeah. Because imagine you, you, you started like now semester, semester one literary Chinese and what will happen this year, literary Chinese two will be taught by Mark Strange. And certainly, I'm quite certain he will do it very differently. Yeah, and I, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying whether he's doing it better or worse, but um, I would like to hear the reactions of students after taking both uh, courses and saying, so what is your teaching experience and learning experience? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's sort of, um, how can I say this? I guess it... Um, it's a bit um, strange for the students as well, they have to get used to new teachers the entire time, or as if they know a teacher, then they can know how best to learn from a teacher as well. So if they're constantly sort of having to readjust, then that doesn't mm. help them either. And because nobody actually stays at uni for three years these days, mm. everybody stays for longer if they can. Yeah. So we're just completely limiting the amount that students can learn and making it harder for them. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you're sp speaking of continuity, this is yes. something that is, I think, totally misunderstood at this university, in, in, in every respect. Yeah. 
you cannot simply go about and um, smash porcelain in, 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 in every room you have and, uh, and then argue, oh, this university is run wonderfully. Yeah. So continuity is something um, needed in universities, in my opinion, and um, this is also confirmed by students. Yeah. So students that know me better or that have done two courses in literary Chinese, for instance, or, or courses in philosophy, they come to my office and um, uh, we interact on a, on a different basis and if they stay longer become honors. They choose me as the honor supervisor yeah, because they, they, they know what they get. Yeah. But this is all um, um, uh, undermined by three-year contracts. Yeah. Mm. So, moving on, um, what benefits do you see from the continuation of teaching less commonly taught languages? <coughs> well, um, me coming from Chinese studies, we're not exactly teaching less common languages, um, but literary Chinese, so Chinese language um, from the beginnings to uh, the 19th century, roughly, um, is a lesser common taught language, not spoken any longer, but it is the entry gate to Chinese culture and understanding China. And we're speaking of um, 3,000 years of written records. Um, and uh, we are speaking of um, an entire development of this gigantic empire um, that is now standing right in front of Australia. Yeah? And um, uh, giving some politicians nightmares with regard um, uh, to what is what is coming from China, right? So Australia and the capital of Australia and the government of Australia um, uh, should really do all in their might to um, keep uh, this section of the Chinese language. If I open this up and speak about um, other um, small enrollment languages, um, it is quite similar. I mean, we can expect that a nation like Vietnam or Thailand will ultimately be certainly not become as powerful as China, but the development trajectory uh, uh, will be quite the same. Right? So Australia will need people uh, that are able to speak these languages. And what has been forgotten, and you can see this, the Chinese, Chinese case is a wonderful example, is that you can, of course, argue, look, people from China, from Thailand, from Vietnam, um, they speak this language, it's easy for them to learn English, and um, uh, then we can use them as translators. What is always forgotten is that we have a loyalty issue. Right. And especially when I think of Chinese translators and they come with delegations from China, it is certain that their loyalties in every respect lie with the Chinese side. How could it be different? So if you're coming in as, as a company and say, oh yes, wonderful, we rely on you as translators, you're losing out all the time. And they don't even notice it. This has been going on for 25, 30 years now. Yeah? But Thinking of Australia and its position in Asia, um, if, and I hope this doesn't sound preposterous from, from, from a European perspective, um, if Australia doesn't want to lose out in this entire development, they better teach small enrollment languages. This is absolutely insane. Yeah, that's, I think, what I have to say. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Mm. I speak Chinese and Japanese myself. Well, mm. beginning learning Chinese. I'm not that great yet. But yeah. I completely agree. You just don't know what they're saying. You, you've got to... There's just so much you can, you can learn by learning the language and then going yeah. to a place. You just get so much more out of it than just speaking English. It just, Yes, and, it and the, the advantage of these, of these languages and the acquisition of, of language and cultural knowledge is, of course, that you can start begin to reflect on your own culture. Mm. Yeah. And 
again um, with my limited experience of Australia um, I would dare to say that Australia would need more people um, that would be able to do exactly this transfer and say look if I have an idea on how other cultures develop what they consider important what they consider not so important and uh, how does that reflect on my thinking about how Australia conceives itself and that maybe when we look at the current situation Australia is in um, that it will become necessary to to reflect and reconsider whether it can continue the way it has continued and I think it can't. Yeah, so you would really be in need of people um, that would have the capacity of saying look I know something about France, I know something about China, I know something about Vietnam and uh, aspects of this knowledge tell me that something is not running the way it should run. Yeah. Mm, I totally agree. Very important. Um, so the next sort of questions is about: um, Are you making uh, an alternative model to these budget cuts as a staff? Um, have you got any sort of alternative solutions to to show us? Well, we're we're essentially um, uh, since these these discussions begun. First of all, we had um, um, Mark Strange was was creating strategic papers in his role as head for. The Japan Center for the Korean Center and for the China Center, and uh, these strategic papers were um, uh, um, written uh, with all the staff consulted, and they were laying out a plan how um, uh, these these centers should be further developed. That's one thing, and the other thing is that um, uh, looking at this this review process and the conflicts that were showing up between uh, research strong disciplines and teaching strong disciplines and established um, established roles versus um, um, uh, uh, the need to change certain roles um, it became obvious that uh, certain political measures that have been undertaken for the last 10 years, last decade, uh, were absolutely the trimal um, to putting centers in a position to be more responsible and to be more self-relying. So the first move was to, 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 decent, to, to, to centralize administration instead of saying come on, we have heads of institutes or centers and they would be responsible uh, uh, regarding the daily business and in the optimal case they would even have an idea uh, uh, how much money is there, how much money is earned and uh, uh, they would say, could say something about um, um, uh, how good they are doing with regard to the budget. Yeah? But all this has been taken away, and so um, uh, the alternative model would, even though it may sound conservative, would be to do what universities did for hundreds of years all over the world, namely to put um, the responsibility back into the hands of those that, that are actually doing the work. Yeah? The idea that you can have some management group that oversees all these things um, is not working. Yeah? And um, so, especially in this, in, this, in this school of CHL, which is this amalgamation, amalgamation, amalgam of, of um, the research school of Asian Pacific Studies and the school of Asian Studies, that were simply thrown together because one couldn't survive without the financing of the other. That was the only silly reason. Yeah? Um, and this is, this is also the reason why we are partly in this mess we are in today. Uh, would be to come to a point where we say, yes, can we re-establish a structure where it becomes obvious uh, which unit is able to sustain itself? 
um, including the language grant and the National Institute grant, and which unit is not. And then it's not uh, a matter of fairness, and this is this, this, this silly idea in this review process, uh, that you can arrive at some kinds of balanced solution. No, you can't. The Chinese study center and the Japanese study centers are the strongest units regarding teaching yeah, in CHL. And they make a lot of revenue, while others don't. And if they don't, and they are, for instance, small enrollment languages, it would be natural to say, yes, then take some of the money we are making to support these small enrollment languages. But why should we support anthropologists and archaeologists? I don't see that. Yeah. And no one, no one understands it. Yeah. But it appears that, that uh, uh, the leadership, and I'm not speaking of, 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 of um, Brian Schmidt, but of his predecessor and uh, the ones on the lower echelons of, 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 of the administration, um, do not want to see that. Yeah? They see it, but they do not want to see that. And they want to come up with some, and this is this four, four house model which we, which we are now discussing, um, that still tries to maintain some balance in, a, in an institution where there never was a balance. Alright, so finally, do you have any additional comments you would like to make? Um, yeah, um, so let me check my, my writing here. Um, I've said most of it, and, um, but one thing I could add and, and is that what is absolutely striking for someone coming from Germany, or I guess also from England or France, is that if you would imagine a large company like Volkswagen or NASA or British Petrol would do a review, how long would they take? Yeah, and I've, I have one example from Volkswagen, which is a huge company in Germany, with um, I can't tell you, but I think it's still something about 200,000 employees and um, uh, a distribution of factories not all, all, only in Germany but all over Europe and they had, they conducted a review and I think that had to be finished within one year. This review here is dealing with 75 people plus administrative staff. And they're fiddling around with this stuff for one and a half years now. In a process that I've never seen uh, uh, in the degree how painful it is for everyone involved. And with a lack of instinct for dealing with your employees, uh, that is absolutely beyond me. Yeah? And um, uh, I would suggest, and this now would go the direction of Brian Schmidt, is if you ever, and this seems to be the plan, conduct reviews in other institutions, um, do plan them well, uh, give them a limited amount of time in which they have to be finished, and get people that can communicate. Yeah and um, that are able to take people on board yeah. and not um, uh, oscillating between oh this I can tell you but this I can't tell you and this I don't know and sorry um, I have to go because I have something different to do. Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, I think this review, as it was conducted, and Brian Schmidt has, has very rightly said and, uh, that never mix financial issues with academic issues. Um, this is one point, but the way this review has been conducted, uh, it should never, ever happen again at any institution at ANU. 
and um, I keep hearing that plans for conducting these kinds of vivus are already underway by the institutions. And um, this is nonsense. And perhaps as a last remark, um, we should have leading administrators in the university that should be so bold to cross over the lake, get into parliament, and tell these people um, uh, what is going on here. Yeah? I feel, or I've, I think many, many people at CHL um, uh, uh, feel completely left alone in the face of a management. Uh, they are not sure what, what or, or not really sure what they are going to do. Yeah, the present state is, okay, we can be entirely um, uh, uh, dissolved here, and then a new school is built up. And it would be the first and foremost task for a boss of a company and uh, the leading administrators and managers to be on the side of the employees. Yeah? And uh, uh, to, to, to struggle for them and not leave this to the unions. Yeah? And not sit there and start to whine and say, oh, we've got lost money, but perhaps find out and look into um, the question, who has lost the money? And this, sorry, is another final point. Um, it is hard to conceive that the mess that has been created is a mess that has been created by administrators. So the deficit we are in is partly, not all, but partly due to mismanagement in this, in this, in this um, uh, department and school. And the people that are blamed for this mismanagement and that bear the consequences are the people that never had a saying in, this, in, this, in these budgetary measures and decisions. Yeah. And so... Um, there must be some place, even in Australian companies slash universities, um, where people step in and say, look, these are my teachers. Yeah? This is uh, our university. And my absolute duty is to at least maintain it and maintain the university in, and parts of the university um, in a way uh, that does not frustrate and, and disillusion the best um, um, assets this university has. And this are the teachers and researchers working here. Yeah. And we would need, whether it's you as, as a student body, whether it's honor students, um, the next step would be to enter into the office of the Minister for Science and Education and tell him what is going on here. And he can whine and whine about the disastrous economical situation of Australia, then bloody do something about it. Yeah. But do not um, uh, 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 risk that... that um, such an institution that is still famous yeah, becomes um, um, uh, something of the past. Yeah, I think I'll stop here. All right. <laughs> Very well said. Thank you so much for your time. Oh.